So I do have the distinct pleasure of introducing someone that I worked with uh, while I was down at the port, uh, Patrick, our speaker for today. Patrick is the president and CEO of NYK Ports LLC, the holding company of USIN terminals and series terminals. He joined NYK in 2008 as chief operating officer at USIN terminals, later becoming the chief executive officer. Following a decision by NYK Group to combine YTI and series, he became CEO of both companies in April 2013. In this role, Patrick is a member of the NYK Group America's Board of Directors, which oversees NYK Line, Usin Logistics, YTI Series, Nippon Cargo Airlines, Crystal Cruises, ooh, and NYK Roro activities in the region. Patrick also holds various board seats on joint venture companies engaged in the port sector in US and Canada. Prior to joining NYK, Patrick spent eight years at Merce Line and APMT, APM terminals in various operational and staff roles, including human resources, line operations, customer service, labor relations, and port operations. He's got over 20 years of experience in the transportation sector since starting his career in 1991 with Sealand Service. He received his undergraduate degree from Seattle Pacific University and his MBA from the University of Southern California Marshall School of Business. He's a native of Ireland, married with three children. It's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to be at this school. Um, the last time I was here was May of, uh, of uh, last year, so it was pretty cool just to take a walk around. I actually saw more of the campus today than I saw when I actually went to school here, um, which was uh, um, not that long ago. Um, many of you in the room could probably deliver the same material that I'm about to uh, share with you because there's a lot of folks here from the, from the port, the history of, of uh, and experience from people that, that uh, have either A, worked there, worked, used to work there, um, but also folks in the supply chain. But before doing that, just quickly, uh, many of you would be students in general in the school at the moment, just to get a sense. Perfect, okay. So two quick things. One is um, I'm to give up a Thursday evening to do something like this. Um, I, hope it's, I hope it turns out to be worth your while. I, I, hopefully it will. And I hope I don't set back your education too far by doing this presentation. Um, so real quick, Geraldine, um, absolutely famous. There are those, though, that might say infamous. Um, um, but by, by, uh, by all means, um, um, I would get, from, on occasion, a uh, text message that would say, so, you know, just got done with a swim. What would you think if we did this with the lease? Or some of these random emails at Sunday mornings, or, and you would say, well, how could you be thinking about that at this time? And of course, then you spend the rest of the day thinking about it because she's put it in your head. <laughs> so um, thankful for that. The, the, one of the last things before um, um, Geraldine moved on from, from the port was to uh, help us negotiate with Catherine a new uh, agreement um, to extend the berth at our facility, to do some backland work, and also uh, uh, take our lease up to 2026. Um, what that represents is about an investment of somewhere in the order of about 60 million for the port and revenues for the port um, over that 10-year period of around $480 million, um, so quite significant. And that's just one of the many, many projects that uh, Geraldine did and Catherine did when they were at the port. And now Mike, who just helped us out here enormously a couple of weeks ago delivering a superb presentation at the Board of Harbor Commissioners to help us get our final EIR approved for the redevelopment at our facility. So thank you for that. And um, Michelle did a little bit on that as well. Probably not that. Um, so I'm, I'm going to... Um, make two quick disclosures. One is, I have not timed this, but it will, uh, it will go pretty quickly. Um, haven't rehearsed it tremendously, actually, at all, but, um, um, but I'd also like to thank Doug Hansen, who put all of this material together, and we just reviewed it here quickly at 2 o'clock this afternoon. I did get a little scared when I saw copies of it outside and thought to myself, my goodness, I hope the stuff in there is accurate, but it is. Um, so very quickly, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, our company. Um, I'm going to talk about, um, because it's important to have some context on uh, a company in this sector um, and then be able to sort of translate that into sort of what does that mean in, in, uh, in relation to port congestion, which is something that a lot of people are dealing with at the moment, us very much so. Um, and then a little bit about um, sort of what are trade patterns and um, what do we see or what will we likely see from an infrastructure perspective 
in the next few years in, in the United States. I've really um, you know, not taken this outside of the U.S., although when you talk about trade patterns, it's hard to just isolate it to, to the U.S. because we're so connected globally at this point. And then a little bit on the solutions. So our company, first of all, so NYK Group is, is, a, um, is a firm, uh, a Japanese firm, um, global transportation organization, has about 900 vessels, um, and is in everything from containers to dry bulk, liquid bulk, air cargo, logistics, um, real estate, cruise holdings, and terminals. And I probably missed two or three lines of activity. In total, it's uh, about a $23 billion revenue company, and it's listed on the topics. Um, our organization is a small part of that as NYK Ports. This organization we just uh, christened just a few months ago, and NYK Ports essentially holds the, uh, the business of series terminals, which is an East Coast primarily and Canada, uh, stevedoring and terminal operating company. And on the, uh, on the West Coast, Houston Terminals, which is in Los Angeles and uh, a smaller operation in Oakland, California. This is a, obviously quite busy, but this just gives you a range for um, the number of customers or the types of customers that we have. And so um, on any given day at um, NYK ports, again, series and use and terminals, there are about 5,000 uh, longshore workers around the United States and Canada that are uh, engaged in the activity. We have about 300 employees. Um, we do about 3.5 million containers uh, a year, uh, 5.1 million uh, cruise passengers, 1,100 cruise ships in that process, um, about 800,000 Roro or cars, um, and I think that's about it. This is a smattering of the, uh, the, the, the customers across the different uh, sectors. So we have either contracts with or um, do business with um, each of these, uh, these, these organizations. Some of them on the shipping line side um, are also in the port business. So NYK line is a shipping line. It competes with some of the shipping lines that you see up here on the top left. Um, but also many of those companies have their own terminal operating uh, subsidiaries. The purpose of that is the, the idea of just sort of having an end-to-end -end, uh, transportation offering to customers where you can take, let's use a container as an example, from an origin, let's say in China, for example, um, all the way from the store door there to the store shelf, let's say in, in uh, Paducah, Kentucky. And so to do that, you have to have trucks on the origin, ports on the origin, ships, uh, ports at the destination, rail, truck, and uh, warehousing distribution and so forth. And so that's what our company offers in, in, uh, in mass. Um, on the cruise side, obviously the cruise piece is, is um, for us, our largest operation is up in, um, up in Vancouver. We operate the cruise facility there. And uh, on, the, uh, on the East Coast, uh, Tampa, Port Canaveral, Jackson, uh, Jacksonville, and all the way up through Baltimore. We do a lot of cruise, including New York. Um, so lots of different customers. Um, I'm going to jump right into the discussion around the, the uh, uh, congestion. And um, there is no one single cause, and there is no one single solution to the issues that we find ourselves in today, particularly in Southern California. And I'm not seeking in this presentation to lead you in one direction or another with respect to what the core issue is. But I will offer um, sort of a series of, of, of uh, ideas or potential uh, elements that are contributing to what we see today. And there are more, so um, we'll, we'll just sort of go through it. I think to add a little bit of context, this is a picture from a few weeks ago. This is what it looks like right about now in the San Pedro Bay. Um, Container vessels, um, we have for our business about four out there at the moment. Uh, there's well over 20 um, in the area, um, and some of those are up the coast, but primarily in this area. So just to give you a little bit of um, sense for, for what's going on. A potentially huge economic story playing out tonight on the West Coast, and the timing is bad. Labor problems at dozens of ports, including the biggest in the country, the Port of L.A. and Long Beach, have caused a full stop of big containerized ships loaded with cargo just off the shore. We get our report on that tonight from NBC's Hallie Jackson, who's in San Pedro, California. Thirteen ships wait to get into the country's biggest port complex. Nothing is moving here. 
Normally, there's no line at Los Angeles, Long Beach, but congestion's been building at West Coast ports, including Tacoma, where Gary Snyder says hundreds of his perishable Christmas trees are stuck on the dock. He expects to lose $50,000 this season, since his shipments probably won't make it to Asia in time for the holidays. We've had to cancel uh, half a dozen containers going to Singapore just because we can't get them into the dock, and if we did, it's going to sit there. It's not just goods headed out, it's merchandise coming in at risk of going nowhere, like Rob Feldman's glass jars from China, glass used to package his gourmet popcorn. Glass jars set us apart, so that would be a huge blow to our company. So why the port paralysis? Management is accusing the Longshoremen's Union of staging an orchestrated slowdown, and some point to a shortage of truck drivers and rail cars and a surge in cargo volume. Is there a slowdown on the part of the union? There's absolutely no slowdown. We're working double shifts right now. We've got guys working around the clock. A coalition of retailers has asked the president to send a mediator, calling these crisis levels of congestion, saying a shutdown would be catastrophic. International economist Jock O'Connell says that could mean a backlog that eventually leads to layoffs. I would very much hate to be the manager of a factory. Uh, who has to send their workforce home during the holiday season. And while many manufacturers work to ship holiday gifts in advance of shopping season, there are some things you just can't send early. Containers are piling up here at the Port of Los Angeles, which is seeing its worst congestion in at least a decade. That's how long it's been since the port last shut down, which is something nearly everyone hopes to avoid this time, Brian. Hallie Jackson at the Port of L.A. tonight. Hallie, thanks. This piece is a couple of weeks old. Um, and um, when we talk about the, the causes of congestion, you know, you, you've, got, you've got symptoms, you've got causes, but I think it's important to note um, that the congestion we have today goes back all the way to the 4th of July weekend, um, which precedes sort of any of the, the, the uh, ILW contract related um, um, elements. So I think this article, uh, tends to sort of point one in a direction that perhaps this is all related to labor issues. Um, it's a factor, absolutely, but it is not the root cause. And you'll, you'll, I'll, I'll let you draw your conclusions as you sort of see some of the other elements influencing where we are today. Oh. So just very quickly, here is this schematic here of, uh, uh, an aerial, I should say, of the Southern California port complex, San Pedro Bay, Los Angeles, and, and Long Beach. It's really one massive complex, um, and um, um, when you put the two together, I mean, it's a, it's a real behemoth, the largest in, in North America by, by, uh, by a long, long stretch. And what you have are, you've, um, let's say, a series of maybe 13, 14 facilities. Um, this is our facility right here, Houston Terminals. Um, our neighbors, Evergreen, APL, APM terminals, CUT, and, and, and so on. So you have sh shipping lines um, with most of them with their own terminal operating company in Southern California. Over time, this will probably change. And the reason it'll change is maybe perhaps a function of some of the things we're seeing today with respect to congestion. It functionally operates as if each airline, if you use the uh, airline analogy, if each airline had its own airport. And so each airline having its own airport is prob would be problematic, um, but you have to understand the history of how the ports evolved to understand why it operates the way that it operates today. And I think over time what you'll see is maybe some consolidation of facilities, larger facilities, to try to eliminate some of the congestion as well as make better land use over, over time. Volume is up in the port. That's going to be one of the factors we talk about relating to congestion. Um, and it's an interesting t statistic that, that uh, I had sort of jotted down a couple of weeks ago when reading the New York Times was, was um, this $89 billion worth of goods uh, will be sold uh, this holiday season. I mean, that, that's an enormous amount, 13% over last year. What that translates to is additional cargo coming over the, the ports. Um, and so not just the United States, but or not just uh, Southern California, but across the country. We have larger vessels. I'm going to talk about vessels a little bit later, but we'll just stick to the congestion piece here. So I'm trying this slide on. I'm probably going to be using this slide a few more times unless we'll see how it goes over here this evening. But what's causing the congestion? Is it a chassis shortage? Maybe. Is it truck power, not enough trucks? Maybe. Um, is it the contract? Maybe. 
Is it the fact that you have different alliances or reforming alliances, perhaps? Is it that you've got dwell time on the terminal uh, of imports sitting longer than they used to, which is making uh, suboptimizing the space on the facility? Or is it just increased cargo volumes? Or are there other factors we're not thinking of? Um, you could get the smartest people in the industry to argue any one of these points, either in isolation or related. Um, and so here's the example. No chassis. Well, if there's no chassis, it doesn't really matter how much truck power you have, because if you don't have a chassis, you can't pull the load. Therefore, it has to be a chassis issue. OK, well then, if there's chassis and there's a lot of cargo on the terminal, we don't have enough trucks. Well, that's not a chassis issue, but we don't have enough trucks. So it's a truck issue. It's not really a truck issue either, because there's more than enough trucks um, optimized, utilized the right way to be able to handle the volume that we have in Southern California. Ah, it must be the ILW PMA contract, because it has to be related to slowdowns or whatnot. One could argue that. It's a contributing factor. Is it the, fa is it the core f issue? Absolutely not. The congestion was here well before that. The alliances, um, reforming alliances, and so this is essentially shipping lines looking to take advantage of economies of scale to remain competitive in a hyper-competitive business. Um, and so one of the things you do is you try to align your vessel capacity with others so that you can lower your unit cost and over time ideally remain profitable and, and uh, compete with, with others. So with those reforming alliances, that has a tendency to move cargo across these different terminals, and perhaps that's the issue, maybe. Dwell time on the terminal. There's no greater means to suck up capacity on a facility than to have imports sit for twice or three times the amount of time that they would ordinarily sit. Ordinarily, you would see a container, an import container, sit on a facility for three days. At the moment, it's about 10 to 12 days. So if that import container sits there for twice or almost three times longer, think about the amount of capacity that you're using with, on the facility and rehandling of containers to be able to ultimately deliver the box. Um, so maybe it's the increased dwell time, but, but maybe the dwell time, the customer wants, but they can't get it because there's a truck shortage and there's no chassis. And so you get this circular discussion that says, well, you could pick any point on here, increased cargo volumes, alliances, any of them, and say that this is the cause. There's about five other pieces I could put on there. Some of them would be more or less controversial, but um, the only way you're, that, that we will ultimately deal with the congestion in, in Southern California is if we can get the, um, the shipping lines, the terminal operators, um, the ports, um, practically together in a room to start to figure out how to optimize the flow of cargo, minimize the amount of truck drays that we do, and, uh, and solve the, the, uh, the current uh, ILW PMA contract. That is pivotal to this, and, and hopefully that will happen here in the next few weeks. That's the presentation. No. <laughs> it, it could be the presentation because this, these, are the, these are the factors. And, and uh, what, what I struggle with is I will get calls from BCOs, um, and some of the BCOs will say, well, OK, well, we're going to be shipping cargo beginning on the 26th of November. This is going back a couple of weeks. And say, you know, should we go over Southern California? Should we go over the East Coast? We need to get to the Midwest. Um, how much time should we add to Southern California? Um, and then they try to plug in this model, build in a contingency so that they don't want to lose the economies through Southern California, but the economies through Southern California are no good if you can't get the cargo to the store. So then there's a balancing act. You don't want to put too much diversify onto the East Coast because if you do that and then it all clears up, well, now we've spent too much. So you get into this really, um, and there are lots of logistics experts, and we've got some in the room here, but lots of logistics experts who spend a tremendous amount of time essentially uh, trying to handicap this and determine you know, when is this going to change and how will it change and when and how can they still remain, manage their cost, but also move the cargo in the most timely manner. Chassis, a lot has happened. Which we're, the, we're the only country, I shouldn't say the only country in the world, but I'm pretty certain the only country in the world and the only one I've ever worked in where the shipping line traditionally provides the chassis. Um, that model is changing. Um, the procedures and the organization around that hasn't caught up yet to the, um, to the divestitures of chassis by the shipping lines. Um, why, do the chassis, why do the shipping lines get out of uh, the ownership of chassis? Because they're expensive. They're expensive to own, they're expensive to replace, they're expensive to maintain. 
um, yet they're vital and um, they're not particularly well used. So I think what you'll see in the next year or so are moves and efforts to be able to optimize the chassis fleet to, to utilize them at a higher basis than they are today and be able to move the same amount of cargo with less chassis. That for sure will happen. How we get there might be a little bumpy, but we will certainly get there as, as an industry. On the road of truck power shortages. This has been a challenging year on the, on the, on the, the truck side. Um, Quite frankly, nobody did more to change trucking in Southern California, the Geraldine, over the period in the port to improve the quality of the air in the port. Um, we went from having very old trucks to very new trucks um, and very clean trucks. Um, and we have that legacy today at the port, which is obviously very, very helpful. Never one person that gets things done, right? But, but it's certainly a result that, that uh, that's a very much a lasting one. One of the issues though that, that we've had on the ports and for the 20 years that I've been around the ports are the owner operator drivers in the port, they have a tough go. The terminals, uh, the gates, um, to be able to get in and get out and make a living doing that um, is not very easy for many of these operators. And so what we've seen over the last year or so um, have been a series of demonstrations intended to sort of raise a voice on behalf of the trucking community to, um, to increase pay and benefits so that folks can earn a sustainable living. Um, that has contributed um, to, not their plight, but that has contributed to the, uh, to the congestion that we see. Because we had a period over the 4th of July or shortly thereafter where uh, we had two or three days where very little cargo moved in Southern California. And in Southern California, when you lose a day, you might as well add a week on the back end to clean up. So if you lose three, four days, you know, you're into three weeks cleanup. So one of the things when we talk about congestion, and I'm sure it's going to come up here a little bit later, is how long will this congestion issue be with us? And the short answer is, I don't know. But once, once um, let's say, things start to return to normal, and I'll talk about what those things might be in, uh, in a few minutes, um, we're probably talking about another two months to get back to, I would say, even keel. Um, now it'll be a gradual improvement, um, but to, to get back to a point where everybody feels that the current, the cargo is moving fluidly again, is going to take some time because you just can't flip a switch when you're talking about this type of activity. Um, one, of the, one of the more interesting statistics here, um, this came from the Journal of Commerce and I, I, I thought it would be interesting to you, is just to demonstrate that the available work opportunities um, for longshore workers um, is up dramatically. And of course that puts stress in general on the availability of labor to continue to sustain, to dig through the crisis of volume and also come out the other end um, um, better. So there is a stress on the labor force in that sense. Um, looked at another way, there's tremendous opportunities for people um, within the longshore workforce right now to have any number of choice of jobs. Um, but um, this is the workforce that does all of the loading and unloading all of the terminal work at all of the West Coast ports, and um, 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 we're hopeful that uh, here in the next month or so, we're going to see, uh, see some real improvement with the contract. The new alliances, the, li the alliances have formed and reformed here in the last uh, uh, year or so, and that'll be, a, I'd say, a continuing evolution. Um, what you have are, you have many shipping lines um, in a, again, a hyper-competitive business, all seeking to remain viable long-term, earn, earn the cost of capital, and be able to reinvest in vessels. Um, there's been a, a systemic issue of, of uh, overcapacity or overtonnage for quite some time. Um, that doesn't look like it's going to change anytime soon. But within the alliances, one of the newer elements that we start to see is this joint procurement of, um, of tonnage. Historically, each line would procure its own tonnage independently. And typically what would happen in the market is if supply got tight um, and, and lines were making some good returns, you know, people would sit in their headquarter offices and say, well, gosh, if we had two or three more ships, we mightn't make as much, but we'd still make a lot. The problem with that is there was 14 other carriers doing the exact same thing and then everyone orders the tonnage at the same time and lo and behold the market was way down. And this, the, the liner market used to be, it is, remains cyclical, 
but it used to have a wider frequency in the before the fluctuations. Now it's tighter and it's more violent. So you have very good years and very bad years. That's increased some of the volatility, which has influenced why we see the alliances forming and reforming. Because again, everybody wants to remain in the business and, and, and profitable. And so the, the ultimate thought is to those who can sustain over the long run, um, you know, they will, there, there, will be, uh, there will be rewards for that. Increased dwell time. Um, why? Uh, there's any number of reasons. Um, we talked about a bunch of them. There was a period where many of the warehouses were full and we just weren't able to push through the cargo even though we wanted it off the terminals. Um, and then when it caught up, then there was so much cargo on the terminal, it was hard to then try to get that cargo back out to the warehouses. And you got into that cycle again with the trucking versus the chassis and so forth. So what's at stake in terms of if you've got this congestion and you've got cargo that has to move, um, you know, what, what are we talking about if we don't fix it? What, what could we lose um, or what could be impacted? Um, these are some staggering numbers when, when uh, we looked at these initially. 60% um, of U.S. Uh, Southern California, 60% of U.S. 60% of the West Coast cargo moves over Southern California. But half of the cargo in Southern California is considered discretionary or intermodal. Um, it's absolutely viable. It's absolutely viable long term. Most people believe it. Um, the evidence of that belief can be seen in the investments that the shipping lines are making or reinvestments in Southern California. But there are real threats and those real threats include things such as the S Smartly, which is some diversification, um, the Panama Canal, but also the Suez uh, Canal. And, and we'll, we'll talk just a little bit about that here in a moment. So there's a lot at stake here and we need to figure out how to, how to fix it. Truly, we have not, Southern California has not lost anything as a result of the congestion. It's just moving more slowly through the ports. You, one, and when I say truly and I underline truly, yes, there has been some stuff that has bled off, but it's not really been any major impact in terms of what's moving through the complex. But these are some of the potential threats over the long term. Let me just speed this up here a little bit. What will be required, as I mentioned, this line terminal operational coordination, rationalization of capacity, um, you know, use of automation, um, improved skills, all of the things that you would ordinarily expect. Um, we have a long way to go in this regard, and, and uh, I expect that we'll, 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 as a result of this congestion, we're going to see <coughs> a renewed effort to speed up the period with which we, uh, we come to conclusions that are going to make this better. So I just want to talk just a little bit. I'm switching gears uh, onto uh, North America in general and just saying so congestion is not something that is unique to Southern California. It can be weather related. Um, it can be the result of weather related shifts such as moving cargo to Norfolk. Norfolk is now a, a heavily congested port at the moment and digging out of that. Um, we've had some truck issues in, in Vancouver um, and then you've got this larger vessels that, 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 um, um, that require investment in infrastructure, and I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. So this is an example of what we have from an order book. It's a little bit dated, but just I want to give you a, uh, just a uh, um, perspective that the vessels are getting larger, um, and the vessels are getting larger to accommodate more trade, but also to take advantage of the economies of scale. Um, one could argue that the rate of growth of new vessels um, does not necessarily mean there are going to be many, many, many more container vessels. There will be a period where you have just a lot more big vessels and all of the smaller vessels or many of the smaller vessels phasing out. Um, so um, this is what the order book looks like. This, this could be updated somewhat, but what it shows you is it's skewing towards this 8,000 TEU vessels and larger. Um, and so 8,000 TU vessel is a container vessel that could hold about 5,000 trucks. So if you think a container you see driving down the 405, think about 5,000 of those on one ship. That's what the capacity of these vessels are. And so when those vessels come to the port, you try to match them, which means you take as much, you, you, you put as much on as you take off. So you could have a container vessel with about 10,000 lifts on there. That's a lot of, a lot of cargo. 
So just to give you a sense for the cargo trends and sort of what's, what's been happening both in terms of growth of cargo, but also the mix of imports, exports, and the distribution of that cargo across uh, the United States. Well, no surprise that the, the, uh, the tonnage is growing dramatically. So if you go back to 1995, we had, what is it, maybe 110 million tons of cargo. In 2013, we have 240 million tons of cargo, or 13. I mean, that's, that's a huge growth in that space of time. The import to export mix, um, we are, as a nation, we import more than we export. Um, but you've seen in the last, uh, I think from 2005 onwards, you see a trend back to, uh, to some uh, uh, improvement in the export uh, markets. So it's about a 60-40 ratio. This is a national statistic. So Southern California leads in imports in a big way. Um, about 33% of all imports go through Southern California. It was higher and there are reasons for, for there are reasons why it's, why it's um, reduced as a percentage but overall in terms of total throughput the cargo volume is still increasing in Southern California. It's just that as, that as the cargo increases, Southern California is not maintaining the same share that it had um, um, over time, and, and the reasons for that we'll, we'll talk about. You can see sort of the gainers here are the, the South Atlantic um, and the, the North Atlantic areas. Um, and we'll see why here. Export growth very much coming from, from the South over time, been fairly consistent in, uh, in the Southern California area. So we start to talk about why are these, why are these cargo um, patterns changing somewhat. So in the mid-90s, you had this massive growth uh, distribution centers, infrastructure um, and investment intended to be able to take cargo from the ports to near dock distribution centers and move them inland ultimately to stores. There's a massive network about 30 miles from here that supports the Southern California port complex. Most, a lot of that came together in the mid 90s, early mid 90s. But then you had things um, such as 9-11. So wh why was 9-11 significant? 9-11 was significant because um, it made a lot of shipping companies and shippers think we need to diversify our cargo maybe to some other ports. Um, why? Because you just don't want to have all of your cargo in, in, in just moving through one gateway. Then we had the 2002 uh, West Coast shutdown. Um, that essentially made Savannah, Georgia. Um, and and when, you, when you look at some of their statistics, you can see this immediate correlation between 2002, the shutdown here, and Savannah going from here to here and they've been able to maintain a lot of that. So over time you see that there's been a little bit of a redistribution. But it's, it, but it's also, and we'll talk about it in a second, the, uh, um, the Suez Canal and the shifting origin loading locations um, that's now making sort of the, the, the Suez Canal a lot more competitive. Maybe a bigger threat than the Panama Canal. Um, rail truck shortages and more recently economic, okay, all water services. So I'm going to go here and then go back. Um, so if you take the blue first, you have really, if that's blue, blue coming from China uh, all the way through the Panama Canal if you want to reach the East Coast. So we're going to, I just want to show you what we're talking about here. When we talk about the, the, the longer term here, what's at stake for Southern California to maintain competitiveness? It is... This block of uh, area becoming a battleground between East Coast and West Coast ports. So who gets to service that? And what are the factors that will be uh, inputs into the decision makers who decide to use either uh, West Coast ports, East Coast ports? And it's not just one thing, as you can imagine, but this, this is, let's say, the battleground. And here are the two paths. Um, and again, it's focusing on, on uh, getting to the East Coast. 
And this goes back to the, the, the comment I made earlier, which is about half of the cargo is discretionary, which means it can go either way, and it's going right into this battlefield area, so to speak. So with the shifting, tr you, you're, you're starting to see um, um, China plus one or China plus two in terms of a diversification of origin for cargo moving to the United States, meaning other countries. It's shifting further west, and the further west it shifts, and you can see the CAGR here for some of these countries is quite impressive. Um, as it shifts, it starts to bring up questions about, well, am I better off to go through the Suez Canal or am I better off to come through the Panama Canal or go through Southern California and rail? Right now, Southern California is, uh, remains dominant. Um, will the Panama Canal make a big, big difference to Southern California? My own opinion, no. Nope but it's gonna force some folks to be more competitive. Uh, terminal operators, railroads, um, and um, ports, um, because we need to maintain the business that we have. Um, but we will see something move there. Um, and then I think the Suez Canal may be a bigger threat than the Panama Canal in time, but who knows, we'll be able to, we'll be able to see that here in the next few years. But this is the area that the cargo we're talking about goes. And I'm not suggesting for a second that Vancouver or Prince Rupert or Mexico are to be discounted because they're not. But just in terms of heft and the ability to move the kind of density of cargo to serve this area, you need to be able to have these major gateway ports to do that. When we talk about the Panama Canal, and we, then we sort of move into sort of what kind of investments. A lot of the ports on the East Coast are investing to be able to handle larger vessels, but a lot of them have a long way to go. One of the challenges that we have from a port perspective in the United States is that everybody is building as if they're going to get the biggest ship that's going to come. The United States doesn't need 14 Los Angeles. Um, but it's very difficult, as you can imagine, if you're sitting in one state, um, saying that you should be the guy who takes the small ships while you're going to let your neighboring state take the big ships. So w states like people, run by people, are competitive and therefore they try to do what's necessary to make sure that their states gets the, gets the cargo. So you see some of that. Um, what this is intended to illustrate is, is as folks maybe use the Panama Canal a little bit more, you're going to need these transshipment locations. So there's been a, I would call it a, a grab for capacity in uh, Jamaica, Freeport, um, um, Caucedo, I don't see it there. But, um, and so the intent would be you take these hub and spoke oper uh, operations where these large vessels come in from Asia or, or from Europe and they marry up um, with smaller vessels, transship um, in these locations and then come up through the Gulf and through the East Coast. So there's a lot of investment going in to facilities in these areas right now to support the Panama Canal. So competing to handle larger vessels will require deep ports. It will require um, a lot of capital investment. It will require a strategy for how freight moves in the United States, and there's a lot of very bright people working on that. Um, but we do need a plan in the United States to figure out how we're going to move cargo most efficiently uh, through, through the ports and get them to market import and export. Um, everybody's looking for the first port of call. First port of call is typically the location where most of the cargo goes off, most of the intermodal goes off, um, and so that becomes the competitive element. And make no mistake, the ports in Southern California are competing with the ports in Oakland and the ports in the P&W and also in, um, um, in, in, in Canada. But one thing I would just like to, uh, you to think about is that we do have three three ports on the West Coast, excluding, obviously, Vancouver and Canada. What tends to happen whenever there's a shock is cargo sucks to Southern California. And the ports that get hit the most are the ones further up the coast. And the reason for that is that this is where the investment is. This is where the railroads have their investments, the shipping lines have their investments, um, and the BCOs, many of them have major investments down here. So when things get tight, stuff sucks to Southern California. That's good for us here. But um, we can't be waiting for the next shock to be able to make sure that we maintain our position. 
A couple of solutions in conclusion here. Um, we need to leverage this deep water. We need to figure out how we're going to deal with uh, the Suez and the, the, the Panama Canal. Um, there's tremendous opportunity to create a lot of jobs, um, direct, indirect, induced jobs related to the activities at the ports. Um, this doesn't have to be a trade-off between things such as infrastructure spend or environment and cargo um, or jobs. It can, all, it can be a holistic um, approach. And, um, and I think we're going we're gonna to see that. And I think the, the big learning that's going to come out of what we see from a congestion perspective at the moment will be how do we ensure that we avoid a reoccurrence in the future and what are the things that need to happen today to prevent that from, from happening three, five years from now. It's interesting because it, in looking at this this afternoon, the, the, the solutions to congestion are also related to the solutions for freight movement in general in the United States, which is um, congestion to improve competitiveness requires a lot of brain cells, but not that many because it's cargo and it's, you know, it can only move in so many different ways. But one thing to keep in mind is that commerce always follows the path of least resistance meaning the cheapest way ultimately to get goods from A to B will be the way that cargo ultimately gets from A to B. And so whatever barriers each element in the supply chain puts up becomes a factor in determining whether there's a junction in the road that makes the cargo go one way or the other way. The good news is that Southern California remains viable, will continue to be viable, um, but it, it's not one where one can be complacent. What you see right now from a congestion perspective is an aberration. It's one of those things that I would call it the sort of the convergence of a lot of factors in the same year. I have never seen anything, so many, so many elements sort of run into each other at the same time um, as I have this year. And, um, and hopefully we'll be able to fix it here quickly. Thank you very much. rationalization nationally doesn't necessarily mean that we sort of group ports together. Um, what, what it means is that within each of the port areas, we need to make better use of the land or optimum land use. And the Port of LA Long Beach has tried to do a lot in that area in the last 10 years in terms of what's the best use for the land that gives the best return, the best environmental use, and also sort of the best commercial use. So that's really what's at, 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 at the core of it, which is, you know, how do you, how do you, it's like, how do you take three small shops and turn them into one big shop mm -hmm. and get the benefits of that, um, both in terms of econ economies as well as service? And how do we get there? That's the million dollar question. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of groups that work on figuring out that. One of the biggest elements becomes, you know, how do you get the competitive element between different ports and port authorities to sort of step aside in the interests of commerce? So follow up, when are you going to take down that fence between you and Evergreen? <laughs> well, we had a, a, a truck back into uh, one of the oh, parts of it. So okay. there's a piece of it that's down at the moment, but, <laughs> but it's not part of a real strategy. So. I understand the need for proprietary terminals when the, uh, when the shipping lines were delivering all their cargo on their own ships. I, I look today and say with 13 terminals, no one can afford to improve or automate 13 terminals. The ports can't, the shipping lines can't. At what point do you look and say, does that model need to change? And, and in your own decision to extend the term of your agreement, um, what, are, what are your thoughts about that? It's complex because um, there is an element of service differentiation. That, that really terminals feel that they're able to offer on behalf of the owner to sort of in some way, again, differentiate. Um, but ultimately, the, 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 when the service becomes impacted by having a smaller facility, the greater good becomes let's have a bigger facility so that you can sort of address the economies piece. Um, you're right, 10, well, 15 years ago, you would look at one terminal and all the, all the containers would be the same color. Today, it's you know, 10, 12 terminals. We just haven't caught up on the land side to what's mm -hmm. going on on the ocean side. Mm -hmm. That's exactly. the fundamental mm -hmm. sort of, and how we catch up will become the sort of the, the Rubik's Cube that folks have to figure out here in the next few years. I know that's a wishy-washy kind of answer, but that's no the way. best. Uh, <laughs> we hear you know, that automation could be effective. I mean, 
Is it effective in foreign countries? Automation becomes a function of how do you improve density even in a, in a, in a scarce land environment. Um, and so automation can play a role in that. So that's one of the dimensions that makes one move in that. The other is the sort of the shift between labor variable labor cost, i.e. man hours, and a shift over to more of a capital model with much less man hours. And so there has to be a balance because we have a, a workforce on the West Coast that essentially the industry grew up on and technology does work. It's not, it's, you have to merge technology with um, existing work practices, history, um, land requirements, um, and also the, the readiness of technology to be able to, to change the, 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 the operating environment. Take our business, for example. One of the, one of the elements that, that, um, that folks talk about is sort of automation, sort of fully automated faci facilities. The cost to automate a facility could be, let's say, a billion dollars. Now, the time that it's going to take to, re to earn a return, if land is not the limiting factor, is way out into the future. So you need a 50, 60, 70 year lease. What we've seen in our industry in the last five, 10 years, who would do a 50, 60, 70 year lease? Because we've seen a massive kind of volatility stuff we've never seen in a very short space of time. So nobody, this person, <laughs> isn't looking at it that way at this moment. <laughs> So yes, technology works, but it's not perfect. And I wouldn't bet on it 100%. The ship just doesn't call in Los Angeles. And so then as it goes to these other, so, so the battle becomes who's got the natural deep water and who can get there quickest either through availability of capital and or access to local markets. Um, so even within the United States, just take the East Coast for a second. So you've got New York battling with Norfolk and Miami. So Miami and Norfolk are the two East Coast deep ports. But then right in the middle, you've got Savannah and Charleston trying to do, do their thing. So everyone, er, every, almost every port, if they're going to remain viable long term and want to be a first port of call, have to invest to be able to be in the game, so to speak. So each state, each port, is trying to think about what kind of cranes do I need, what infrastructure, what meaning roads, bridges, land, crane. Oh, I said the cranes and and uh, and obviously chassis, like the whole chassis issue is that replicating itself in other places. Or I mean, you know, this is the one you're hearing about because we're the biggest. Right. I'm just you know, and in the U.S. But let's well, say the po the pooling system on the East Coast is a little bit further evolved than on the West Coast. So they've been doing it for longer. Um, and they're better at it. Uh, ultimately, what we will have is, and how we get there is the challenge. We're going to have less chassis used more efficiently, delivering more cargo. Um, and so what we have right now is we're in between an inefficient model and an efficient model. And I'm not sure on that continuum quite where we are yet. Um, but we're, we're in transition. What the shipping lines are looking to do is to be able to offer a network of offerings at a, the lowest possible cost. And so to do that, you're trying to leverage every element that you can in the supply chain to keep that cost low. And by keeping that cost low, it ultimately has a dampen on inflation. And so when you start talking about smaller vessels, you almost need to get into a discussion on inflation at the same time, because if the ships got smaller and the costs went up, then perhaps the cost of the goods are going to go up. Um, I completely understand, Jim, what you mean by sort of the idea of having a smooth pipeline. We don't. We have bottlenecks. And, and the bigger ships create those bottlenecks. But it's, it's, it's interesting because things tend to only change when something sort of runs into something else, so to speak. So the big ships are going to be coming, so then it's going to be who's going to invest. Everyone gets out of the chassis, so how now do we get to the next evolution of it? And I, I wasn't trying to be smart with that answer, but that, it's about cost. And it's about what are the, what are the BCOs prepared to pay and how do, how do the shipping lines keep the costs at a certain level. You could very easily argue, yes, but the additional congestion and the additional um, bottlenecks add cost that's also being passed through. So I, I, keep in mind that I'm, I'm sort of biased because I'm coming from a, an industry. So you have to take it with a grain of, a grain of salt.
There was a question in the middle there. Or, okay, back there. When you got to the slide on the dwell times, your dwell time in that slide wasn't too long. I, I was able to catch the chassis uh, component to the dwell time. Uh, what are some of the other components of that dwell time issue? Meaning, why is dwell time high? Yeah. You, you I think mentioned it, the chassis shortages. Uh, what were some of the other reasons for the dwell time? So, if a warehouse is full and the cargo is at the port, but you have nowhere to take it, or the stores are full, and you have an intentional, um, let's say, say, sort of moderating of the supply chain to be able to meet the demand. Because, there, as you well know from a freight forwarding perspective, you know, you've got people are betting on consumption. And so, if you make that bet wrong, and you make it on the low side, and then you're trying to catch stuff up, if you make it on the high side, then obviously you're, you're going to sit on cargo. But the, the challenge becomes you can't say that that's the, 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 the only issue because I've had many customers say, well, you know, we want to get the cargo, but we can't get it. Why? Well, the terminal's congested. Why? Well, because of the chassis. Well, I can't get a truck. And you get into that circle. Um, so three, time, three days dwell time for an import is what most terminals are built on from a utilization perspective. You go to nine, and you just artificially reduce the capacity of that facility dramatically. And then you're into demurrage, and then you're into the negotiation of demurrage. And, and it, it demurrage negotiations are for other people. I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Um, just curious, if, if you were to look at the demurrage issue from a demand side, so I'll do a quick infomercial or commercial from, from so no one has more gates open in Southern California than Houston terminals. Um, we're running Sunday gates, Friday night gates, stuff that we have not done before. Um, so, uh, so we're open. So the 24-hour gates has to be, if, if one moves to a 24-hour gate system, it has to be done in conjunction with recognizing the utilization of truck power. So do you have truck power that you can distribute so that you can utilize all 24 hours? And maybe, maybe the answer is, yes, you do. Um, but then you have to also start thinking, are you going to change your warehousing model and move inland and work those 24 hours as well? So it has to be, it's one of those, it almost has to be a holistic. Everyone, not everyone, a lot of people jump to, well, gosh, if we open 24-7, congestion goes away. It probably helps, but it's, the only, it's only one dimension. Um, so then why wouldn't you exhaust that dimension? Well, because we don't know whether the truck power will be able to show up within that period between 3 a.m. and 8 a.m. in the morning. Because most of the trucks today that move in Southern California, folks start work at noon and they finish at midnight. So you've only an X number of hours you can work. So you have periods sometimes from 8 to noon and from midnight to 3 a.m. where there's not as much activity. I would say it's more stretched out now where we're using all of those available hours. Um, to be fair, it's also extremely expensive to operate the third shift. And it would seem that one question in terms of which transshipment hub is best positioned, uh, it tends to be whether or not the ships, once they come through the Suez Canal, are going to go to Antwerp or the Rotterdam in the string first and then coming around uh, to the sea lane, the northbound sea lane, or whether they're going to come straight across the Atlantic. With, as these new uh, strings occur, where, where do you see them riding? Do you see them doing a Northern Europe stop, or do you see them coming straight? Yeah, what you're seeing are more um, what are called pendulum services, which are sort of east-west services that sort of cover the circumference, so to speak. Um, what you will likely see is those, let's say the vessels that are coming through the Panama Canal, as the East Coast ports, some of them are, are deeper, you'll, have folk, you'll, you'll then have the trade-off between the cost of transshipment versus, hey, if the port can handle it in Miami or Norfolk or Charleston, I'm as well off to keep that cargo on there because I'm going North Europe anyway, drop it there and then go up North, hopefully stop at our terminal in Halifax on the way, and then go over to, to, uh, to, to North Europe. That's and, and so those decisions will be driven in part by, well, they'll be driven by cost, but they'll be driven by which ports are ready to handle the cargo. Um, I've got a question. Do you really see Miami as a player? We operate in Miami. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, <laughs> so let me give you just a couple of observations. Just okay. observations. I'm not. Right. Um, there's a very large local market mm. that's growing. Mm. Um, geographically, um, you're at the bottom of a peninsula, and you have to get all the way up through that to get into the interior. So is it ideal for inland cargo, mm. in my view? No. Um, you're better off to go into sort of the Gulf or Jacksonville or, 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 or north. Um, but there's been a tremendous amount of investment to try to offset the geographical sort of handicap. Um, and the, the state has, has, has dramatically improved the road and rail infrastructure in and out of there. Um, so, so do I think, I think it has more of a chance of being a, a transshipment hub than it has being uh, an intermodal mm -hmm. location. That's probably the last piece of cargo that the Port of Miami is going to let us move. Back <laughs> okay, all right. This is my own opinion here. Um, 20,000 to 22,000 TEU max. Now, this is, I remember when there were 3,400 and 4,000. I think the economies of scale start to tip the other way once you get to 14,000. And this might go to sort of Jen's comment because there's only going to be so many ports that are going to support a 22,000 or 20,000 TEU mm -hmm. vessel. So 14,000 might be the new sweet spot. Um, and how quick, I mean, we're investing in vessels. Um, a lot of folks are investing in vessels at the minute. I think to be viable as a global shipping line, you almost have to have the badger saying, I've got one of the 20,000s, because we're, we're in the 20,000s, right? And so you'll see in Asia Europe that, that maybe has, has that, but you'll see joint procurement by shipping lines, sort of the next evolution of the alliance, sort of buying these ships together. Um, and um, so I think another really Asia Europe, two, three years, even though there's one or two of them going already, but the workhorse will be the 14,000 Trans-Pacific. It's just a question of how to get there, maybe three to five years before that's the dominant versus the 8,000 TEU. What is the ultimate best, most efficient capacity? What's the logical how big, how soon for the Port of LA and Long Beach? When should we say, no, we're not going to take more 20s? Um, logical is somewhat subjective <laughs> in any environment, right? So, but I would say logical is around that 14,000. Um, but there's a couple of dynamics that change once you get to that. You don't dramatically need more infrastructure on the key side as the vessels get bigger because they're wider um, and they're actually deeper in the water. So you don't necessarily have to go, f to go from a 14 to an 18, you don't have to rebuild all over again. I'm worried about carrying the containers once they get to the port. How well, do you we, get them out? What we need to be able to do in Southern California better than we do today is move cargo from the dock on the rail into the interior and get out of this near dock trucking business. It's, it, that's, in my view, the right, the right answer. We don't want to artificially handicap ourselves in Southern California and say, you know what, we have enough. There's a number, but you want to be competitive. And then trade patterns will start to dictate and consumption whether we'll remain viable. Has, uh, has your company looked at any options of uh, getting off dock and making uh, local off, uh, off dock uh, terminals local? How we go to market from a, a terminal and near dock, off dock and whatnot is a very live and open discussion at the minute, but yes is the short answer. Not to be, but yes. Obviously we knew what happened in 2002 and then in 2004 where we had congestion issues and then the ILW issues prior to that, right? From the learnings that we got from that, how can we can we uh, prepare ourselves to avert a situation like this? Because when July 4th came around, it was already too late. And that's only then that people started talking about the possible congestions that were going to go forward. And many of us who lived through those moments said, oh, well, we hope from that past experience we won't live through that again and that this will dissolve rather quickly. But I'm just worried about how information is uh, forecasted in that sense to be able to avert the situation. The factors in 2002 versus the factors today are vastly different. Um, um, you know, who would have thought the culmination of sort of 
um, divestitures of chassis, an increase in cargo volume, uh, a reforming of the alliance, a labor contract, um, and truck power related stuff would all happen within the same few months? I mean, I, I don't know that there's anyone in our industry that predicted. Everyone at the beginning of, a, let's say, a contract year sort of consciously thinks, okay, we need to think about it. But all of those things all at the same time was really unprecedented. It just means, though, that going forward, we have to plan for the unprecedented. And what are the other unprecedented unplans that we... It was a month ago or two months ago, the, there was discussions that there would be another 3,000 chassis on board. Um, what's happened with that, and how important of a factor is that to the problems that are going on right now? One man's opinion, we don't have a shortage of chassis. Um, we just don't have an endless supply of chassis to cover all probabilities of cargo dwell, truck availability, and as a result, you, sort of, you, you almost create an artificial shortage. Um, one other factor, when cargo volume in the uh, early springtime was down a little bit, a lot of folks put chassis on hold. And then when the cargo shot back up, there was a lot of chassis that needed to come back into service and be repaired. And so there was a little bit of a hangover um, that, that you know, has now been alleviated, but as chassis came out of what I would call sort of mothballing for a while. So nobody really predicted that it would change so quickly. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it, it's it, all of the probabilities, if you built 10,000 more chassis and the dwell went up, by another 10 days, um, and, and I mean at the customer's door as well as uh, maybe at the terminals, um, maybe you're stuck again. So uh, it's, it's a bit of a, a moving target. If we stopped draying cargo from the terminals to near dock rails, that would build in a tremendous amount of capacity. We need to load more on dock. That, that has to be a central theme of Southern California's ability to maintain competitiveness going forward. How much of a factor is that if we had the technology in place, would it have made a difference uh, in hindsight at all, where a trucker goes into EPM, waits six hours, then leaves and goes to another terminal to pick up a chassis and come back. So instead of a three hour move, let's say it's, which just happened two days ago, I had a trucker for 11 hours waiting for a container guy is stuck at one terminal and he can't make the pickup at the other terminal. So it doesn't matter if you've got chassis at the other terminal if the guy's stuck over, you know, at, at, at so uh, um, there isn't a lot of sort of chassis being drayed between terminals. Th there is logic being, being, being introduced in terms of sort of, I'm going to drop an empty, you, 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 the term dual transactions. I'm going to drop an empty at the terminal and then I'm picking up an, 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 uh, an import and going back out. So you're utilizing the chassis sort of on the way in and the way out. You're seeing less and less of a guy just dropping off an empty and leaving the chassis there, or a guy just picking up an empty. And, and so it's, the, the, it's starting to get more sophisticated and smarter use, but it's still got a long ways to go. Caltrans is getting ready to release a statewide freight mobility plan. And I'm just wondering from a terminal operator perspective whether statewide freight planning is a help, a hindrance, or maybe just a non-factor. I don't know. I think um, if, 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 the, if the core of the charge is to figure out how do we optimize the activity of commerce to be the least amount of touches, um, to move the most amount of goods, then I would say yes. Um, the question is who's at the table, what are the interests, and are they aligned? And if, 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 if those become elements that sort of support a better approach, we would absolutely be in, engaged with that.